Okay, I think we can uh, start. Um, it's my great pleasure to uh, moderate uh, this very, very important session um, uh, for uh, which I have done for a number of years. Um, and I've always enjoyed enormously. Whether the panelists have enjoyed as much as I have done is, of course, a, an open question. Maybe that's why I'm invited back. Um, the, uh, the issues, obviously, in front of us are um, of enormous interest and importance. Uh, before I introduce the panelists, not that I think they need much introduction, um, I will just set out very briefly where I think, uh, what my sense of, what, uh, of where we are in this uh, World Economic Forum, um, and the issues that we are going to have to address in thinking about 2012, both what might happen to the economy and the big policy questions. Uh, the agenda is very long. We will do our best to cover it, uh, and we will certainly leave some time for questions and answers. My sense of the, uh, the mood in Davos is that people are feeling relief in the way that somebody who has just been reprieved from hanging feels a relief. Uh, that instead of facing the imminent prospects of catastrophe, there is a sense that things have been done which have eliminated very substantially the immediate risk of disaster, particularly in Europe, uh, particularly because of the active activities of the European Central Bank, though not exclusively so, and that therefore uh, we can start thinking about the slightly longer term, which is, means at least a few months, uh, and perhaps even longer. But the uh, the, uh, um, at the same time as the IMF reminded us um, uh, this week, uh, the prospects for this year look pretty bad. They have downgraded global growth and developed country growth in particular very significantly. Growth, I remember, if I remember correctly, down to 3.3%, and with the Eurozone now expected to be in recession. So the a uh, long story of difficulty, particularly in the developed world, uh, what I think of as the, the great deleveraging, um, which is now following a financial crisis that began four and a half years ago. Remember how long we are, have been in this, and nobody can say that we are through it. So this is or even not even clear that we're through the halfway. It's the, this is an incredibly long process we've been in, with recurrent crises and now increasing concern, of course, about sovereign debt, uh, quite particularly in the Eurozone, where the stresses have been very, very extreme. So that's one part, the downgrading of growth, um, as a result of what I think uh, uh, Madame Lagarde has referred to as self-inflicted wounds by the developed countries, and we all know what she's referring to. At the same time, and I'd just like to remind you of one or two statistics, uh, um, the developments in the rest of the world, above all in the emerging world, have been quite s staggering. If you go back to the October 2000, September, October 2011 World Economic Outlook, and you looked at the IMF's forecast for 2012 and converted this back to a 2007 base, so that's when the world just when the world economy was moving into crisis, and you ask yourself what has happened to the economies of the world as the IMF forecasted from 2007 to 2012, you will discover that according to the IMF forecasts, over that period, China's economy will, will expand by 60%. The Asian developing and emerging countries, which is, I would remind you, half of the world's population, will expand by 50%. The emerging world by well over, by about 35% and the developed world by essentially zero. So for this five years has seen the most extraordinary and unprecedented speed of transformation of the relative weight of countries. So in, in addition to this great deleveraging, there is this great convergence. These two processes are shaping our world and it's obviously what we want to focus on. So with that little introduction, let me just introduce you to the panelists. Uh, starting on the far left is uh, uh, Robert Zellick, of course, president of the World Bank Group, 
the World uh, Bank, has been a frequent member of this panel. Next to him is uh, Governor Mark Carney of, uh, um, from Canada, who's also now uh, chairman, is it, of the Financial Stability Board, responsible for the regulation of our financial system. Next to him is Deputy Prime Minister. Uh, it doesn't, is this not working? Oh, that's good. Uh, sorry, I had no idea. Uh, Okay, next to him, let's hope that's not true for everybody because it's going to get very awkward. Um, the, next to him is Deputy Prime Minister uh, Mr. Ali Babajan, who has, of course, uh, uh, been responsible for economic policy in Turkey for a long time. Next to him is Christine Lagarde, who's been previously on this panel as Finance Minister of France, but of course is now Managing Director of the International Monetary Fund. Next to him is Mr. Donald Tsang, who's Chief Executive of Hong Kong. Next to him is uh, uh, George Osborne, Chancellor of the UK, um, Chancellor of the Exchequer. And finally, uh, Minister Furukawa, uh, who is uh, uh, Minister for National Economic Policy of Japan. For some reason that I cannot even begin to imagine, there is no representative of a Eurozone government on this panel. <laughs> I'll speak for them. And I certainly don't take it personally. Um, so I'm going to start off then um, with you, um, um, Christine Lagarde, if you could set out how the, you and the fund now see the world and how concerned you remain despite some of the things, the improvement in tone about the, uh, about the world economy in 2012 and the issues that confront us. Thank you. Thank you very much, Martin. Does that work? Yes. Great. Uh, you've asked us on the panel to focus on solutions, and I will try to do that, but I would like to preface that with uh, just three comments. Number one, no one is immune in the current situation. It's not just a Eurozone crisis. It's a crisis that could have uh, collateral effects, spillover effects around the world. And, you know, we'll, uh, we'll hear from others. But what I have seen and what we're seeing in numbers and in forecast is that no country is immune and everybody has an interest in making sure that this crisis is resolved adequately. Number two, I would say that now is the time. There has been a lot of pressure building in order to see a solution uh, come about. And number three, I'd like to just refer to uh, Churchill, if I may, who used to say that we have the tool, we must do the job. The IMF is one of the tools, but we need a toolkit to actually address uh, the crisis as it, as it is at the moment uh, unfolding. And focusing on solution, Martin, if I may, I'd like to uh, address the European current situation, particularly the Eurozone, then what other countries need to do as well, because as I said, it's a toolkit and it's not going to uh, rely exclusively on one single region, uh, and number three, what the IMF can do. Turning to Europe and to the Eurozone in particular, the IMF sees three necess necessary solutions to the current situation. The first one is about growth, and, and growth will be critical for many reasons. Uh, to deal with the job issue, to deal with the fiscal consolidation necessity, and I'll come to that in a second, and to just encourage value creation in a part of the world where, as you said, in the last five years, there's been pretty much zero growth. And growth, in our view, is predicated on essentially two components, monetary policy aside, which is obviously an, another one, but I would like to focus on the other two. And the first one is a combination of liquidity, so that banks in particular have sufficient liquidity and clearly uh, what Mario Draghi, head of the ECB, has done in the last weeks of December is critical, but also, more importantly at the moment, a decent firewall. There is work underway, there is progress as we see it, but it is critical that the Eurozone members actually develop a clear, simple firewall that can operate both to limit the contagion and number two, to provide this sort of act of trust in the Eurozone so that the financing needs of that zone can actually be met if the finances of the world are not interested in that zone. And the second aspect that will actually build growth in that zone is obviously competitiveness. And competitiveness is uh, 
a very important factor that needs to be tailor-made, that needs to be customized to the country, as is fiscal consolidation. And if I can deliver a very clear message, Martin, on this one, it's that we are not suggesting that there should be fiscal consolidation across the board without differentiation and, and without specific, specific treatment adjusted to the specificities of the country. Some countries have to go full speed ahead and do that fiscal consolidation that is so much needed. I would include in that category certainly those countries that are under program and a few others. But other countries have space, have room and can do something. And there are not many of them. I can think of one or two. Those ones, they should certainly explore what they can do to actually boost uh, growth in their respective uh, quarter in order to help themselves but also in order to help uh, the rest of the zone. Just like competitiveness has to be tailor-made and adjusted to the weaknesses and strength of a country, to its comparative advantages and to the demand that is addressed to it, equally the fiscal consolidation that is needed need to be adjusted, need to be customized to the country and cannot be just across the board because otherwise it will simply strangle the little growth uh, that, there, that there is or that there could be. That's as far as uh, the growth Firewall and liquidity. Third component that we see as a necessity uh, for Europe is clearly more integration. Uh, I've, I've said it, I will be happy to repeat it. In addition to having a, a monetary zone, the Eurozone needs to develop this fiscal consolidation compact uh, that is currently in the work and that we hope will be uh, strengthened and validated on Monday at the uh, Leaders' Summit and, and, and further pursued because it's a process. I, I certainly agree with Chancellor Merkel that it's not a sprint, and so it's a marathon, but one along the way of which there needs to be deliverables. Turning now to the US and Japan, because this session cannot be all about Europe, 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 although the Eurozone has to do very important things very quickly. But turning to the US and Japan in particular, those two countries are running higher deficits than the Eurozone on a consolidated basis. They run very high debt, completely different structure depending on whether you sit in Japan, the US or the Eurozone. But equally, those countries have to anchor in the medium term what they're going to do about this constant regular deficit in the last few years and how they're going to turn around the debt trajectory that, that is theirs at the moment. Emerging market economies, and particularly those that are in a surplus situation, they have to continue what they have begun to do, which is to actually reconcentrate on the internal market, on the domestic consumption, rather than rely too exclusively to, uh, on export and, and investment. That could apply equally to advanced economies that are in a surplus situation. So that's pretty much what can be done by the Eurozone in particular, by the rest of the world, I recognize that it's very sketchy, Martin, but in the interest of uh, being brief and to the point, I've, I've decided to be, uh, to be a little bit elliptic. What the IMF can do, because the IMF is one of the tools that I referred to earlier on, is clearly to act as an aggregator of, of trust, as a, a propagator of stability, and certainly in that process needs to demonstrate the multilateral support of its membership to actually accommodate uh, and supplement uh, some of the situations, not in the Eurozone, but in any country that is a member of the IMF. There will be needs in the Eurozone, no doubt about it, but in Central and Eastern Europe, there will be needs as well. And in other countries, including in low-income countries, including in middle-income countries, there will be needs, short-term for some, longer-term for others, and it's for that reason, Martin, that I'm here with my little bag to actually collect a bit of money. Thank you. I take it that this is not a plea to the business leaders for a philanthropic gesture. <laughs> but we will certainly come back to the question of IMF resources uh, uh, after the introductory remarks. I'm going to turn now to uh, Governor Mark Carney, um, how you see the world economy. Um, you are presiding over an economy that seems to be happily immune, uh, presiding in the monetary, monetary sphere, obviously. Um, some people say that, uh, a number of people said this, that the striking feature of this crisis is all the countries that have recently had crises, by I mean, in the last three decades, have managed to avoid a crisis this time, and actually at least two are represented here. But I also would like your view on how you see the financial sector 
more broadly in your present role and its resilience, because um, that's been an enormous concern in the last few months. Uh, and I think it can't have really gone away just because uh, uh, Mario Draghi has decided to provide even more money than before. So uh, what's your perspective on where we are in that, those two respects? Okay. Uh, thank you, Martin. Just in terms of overall um, outlook, I absolutely agree with the IMF. I mean, this is a 3% growth world, uh, a, roughly a 2% United States, uh, an 8% China, China decelerating but to a, a still strong pace. Um, importantly in that, though, is the impact of the Eurozone crisis in our view. Um, uh, the impact of Europe on the level of global GDP is about 1% off the level of global GDP at the end of 2012. So we're all going to feel this, and that's in a world where this crisis is contained. Um, and containment's different than resolution. Um, so why is there the impact? There's an impact in terms of the order of austerity in Europe. We have Europe down 1%, a little more than the IMF uh, for 2012. But secondly, through financial channels, and I'll get to that uh, in a moment. Um, to go back to where you started at the very beginning, though, uh, we are in a great deleveraging in the advanced economies, um, and it's very hard to grow economies uh, unless you're – it's very hard to delever unless you're increasing leverage somewhere else. And there's only really two options in the world, the corporate sector and the emerging markets as a whole, and we'll hear more directly uh, from, uh, from colleagues on the latter, so I'll focus on the corporate sector and the link uh, with finance. Um, and you, you, I, I think uh, part of the mood here uh, in talking directly to the real economy um, is there's a lot to do, but there's a great deal of uncertainty. We've contributed to that um, uh, from uh, our respective roles uh, and our respective jurisdictions. I'll give you one, one fact or, or uh, anecdote, if you will. Uh, the M&A backlog at major investment banks is at an all-time high. So the number of potential transactions that CEOs are contemplating, and the equity backlog, is also at an all-time high. The actual execution of these deals is frightfully low. Anyone who's seen the, uh, uh, the most recent results of uh, the major investment banks would know that. Um, the point is there's things to do, but people are understandably pulling back. Now, you referenced the measures of the ECB uh, in December and, and upcoming, absolutely taken tail risk out of the financial system, um, which is incredibly important. There is not going to be a Lehman-style uh, event in Europe. That matters. Um, but that is different than having a well, fully functioning banking system uh, in Europe, a banking system that's lending to the real economy. We see uh, deleveraging effects, prospective deleveraging effects, I don't think we're really seeing these yet, um, in a number of key financial uh, markets, uh, in project finance, in trade finance, in the commodity markets, uh, there is a direct pullback uh, by European institutions. Um, we also, uh, I, th I think we should be conscious that uh, the majority of foreign holders of emerging market debt are European, um, and some of this pull of capital back into Europe is, has directly affected uh, emerging market capital flow. So we're getting a perverse flight, uh, maybe not to quality, but uh, flight uh, home bias uh, uh, from where we need growth and need capital um, to where it's uh, being repaired. Um, uh, you know, overall, in terms of the uh, uh, where the financial system, and I'll, I'll, I'll conclude with this, uh, the system is much healthier as a whole than it was in 2008. Uh, capital has increased in virtually all jurisdictions, although the least in Europe, which is one of the fundamental issues. Um, liquidity is up substantially in all jurisdictions. Uh, in fact, there's probably too much liquidity uh, being held directly in the financial sector. Um, and uh, th those are the positives. Um, less po and, and, and a number of structured markets and other markets that cause problems have have diminished very much in importance. The other way that financial resilience has increased, though, is less positive, and I'll finish on this, which is that the contingency measures that institutions are taking for the possibility of a more adverse outcome in Europe and elsewhere are holding back their willingness uh, to, pro uh, to provide finance across a range of pro projects. So um, implementing Christine's solutions will make a real difference in terms of corporate attitudes, I think, but also in terms of the direct supply of capital. Thank you very much. One of the issues that is, I think, very much raised by this, which perhaps come back to, which a lot of the bankers complain about, um, is that they're being asked simultaneously immensely to improve their capital ratios and to increase their lending. Uh, the, the, so I'm sure you'll want to ad address that sort of concern and, and indicate how completely coherent and cohesive and together the uh, policy m direction is 
for the world economy. Um, let me now turn to you, um, Chancellor. Um, you are in the slightly strange position of being the, the nearest we have to somebody who can speak for the Eurozone. Uh, <laughs> this is... The irony will not be lost on anybody. Um, but anyway, you are in the meetings uh, on this. I'd like you to think a bit about, from your perspective, where the UK is in this context, um, uh, what the options for the UK are, and also particularly where you, you personally think the Eurozone has got to, and uh, what you might add to Christine Lagarde's uh, indication um, of the priorities. And one of the issues there, I, perhaps we can touch on now, or perhaps go, come to later, is what you, think, what you think the role of the IMF needs to be in that crisis. Uh, thank you, Martin. And uh, yeah, I'm looking forward. It's probably the only time in my life I intend to uh, speak for the Eurozone. The, uh, uh, I think the mood, people have commented on the mood at this conference being quite somber, but uh, having been here for a couple of days, people have also uh, pointed out that actually people are slightly more optimistic at the end of the week than the beginning. Um, even if, as you put it, Martin, that's because they um, haven't been uh, hanged. Uh, I, I think. Uh, of course, the, the economic challenges are very self-evident to uh, particularly Western economies, particularly European economies, and uh, the UK is uh, certainly not immune to that. But I think if, if I would focus on three things which I think lie within the hands of policymakers, uh, positive actions that would turn a, a more optimistic mood at the end of uh, an early week of January into a more optimistic outlook for the world economy at the end of this year, I, I would focus on these. I mean, first of all, the Eurozone. I think it's important to recognize that for elected politicians to achieve what has already been achieved in the Eurozone is incredible, has been a, a real um, act of courage to pool your national resources into a common fund to help other countries is very controversial. Uh, to undertake austerity measures usually gets you kicked out of office uh, unless you manage that uh, correctly. Uh, to um, uh, to undertake difficult structural reform of pensions or labor markets is, again, very controversial. Uh, and uh, a lot of these things have happened over the last 18 months within the Eurozone, and I think we should uh, credit that. Uh, but I think more needs to be done. Uh, I think the Eurozone understands that, and I think it needs to happen in the next few weeks. And uh, the two things I would focus on are, first of all, the creation of this firewall. Uh, it's been much talked about. Um, but I think that is now a key to uh, uh, unlocking further confidence. Uh, and the second thing, which uh, I, I'm not sure has been mentioned yet, is Greece. I mean, the fact we're still, at the beginning of 2012, talking about Greece again. Uh, and I think Gre uh, is a sign that this um, problem has not been dealt with, that this is the, the danger here is that the tail wags the dog throughout this crisis. In other words, the inability to deal with the specific problems in the periphery causes uh, shockwaves across the whole European economy and the world economy. And, and concluding the, uh, the deal that will lead to a more sustainable situation in Greece, I think, is actually fundamental to stability in the Eurozone. But I think those things can be done, and I think they can be done over the next uh, couple of months. Uh, the second thing I think that needs to happen is uh, I think uh, policymakers need to get a greater grip on the deleveraging process. Now, part of that is a deleveraging of, um, of public sector uh, debt uh, and Obviously, uh, spe spe you know, talking my own book, I think you, we've demonstrated in the UK that even if you have a very high budget deficit, and we have one of the highest in the world, uh, a credible plan to deal with it can command market confidence, give you very low uh, rates in the market, uh, and provide a, uh, a platform of stability uh, in uh, an otherwise very volatile time. I think the other thing that we uh, I think all need to better understand is the deleveraging happening in the financial system, an inevitable consequence of a, uh, of a, of a financial crisis and a balance sheet recession. But I think the point that Mark made is something I, I, I would like to see more attention uh, to from policymakers over the coming weeks, uh, which is the, uh, the sort of balkanization of European finance, uh, which has happened as a number of institutions and individuals uh, have uh, taken actions to protect themselves from the uh, tail risk of uh, things going wrong in the euro and what the impact will that be on, 
on the European economy and how that can be unwound, uh, which I think is very important. And I think one of the things we can all do is also provide uh, regulatory certainty this year. Uh, of course, it's inevitable after a big banking crash that you consider uh, how to avoid these things happening again, and certainly in Britain, and maybe we can come on and talk about that, uh, we've done a lot of work uh, in, in looking at how we can better protect our banking system, work that uh, Martin himself was involved in. Um, but we now need to move to the point where we tell everyone what we're going to do, uh, give clarity on the rules. I would include uh, the United States in this with the Dodd-Frank legislation, and again provide some stability which will provide a platform for investment. The final point I make is that I think we need to restore some confidence in the ability of the multilateral organizations to work uh, effectively. Uh, we can come on and talk about uh, IMF resources, uh, and I think there is a case for increasing IMF resources, and I think that would also be uh, a way of uh, demonstrating that the world wants to help uh, together solve the world's problems. Uh, but I think there's also an important uh, task ahead for the FSB and Mark uh, this year. And on trade, which you know, I continue to think is one of the most disappointing features at the moment of the world, that we have not been able to pick up uh, the free trade agreement that we know uh, would act as a significant economic stimulus, not just for the real benefits it would bring, but also because it would demonstrate that we are able to take collective action for the common good. I think in the absence of that, uh, I think it is actually uh, positive to see more regional trade agreements uh, in the European context, the deepening of the single market, uh, and bilateral agreements, uh, in the case of Europe, bilateral agreements between the European Union and, for example, India, which I think would, again, demonstrate that we are not uh, retreating into protectionism, uh, but actually moving forward in opening up markets. All those three things are within the hands of policymakers. They are not, uh, they are not things that we require uh, acts of God or um, un unguidable forces of nature to deliver. These are all things that uh, people, such as the people in this room, can get together this year and deliver. Thank you very much. May I now turn to um, I mean, the issues you've raised we'll absolutely come back to, if at all possible. Um, pretty well all of them, I think. Let me turn to you now, um, Deputy Prime Minister Babajan. Perhaps uh, I very much want you to talk about your own country and the region. Lots is going on. What are the economic significance of that? It's obviously a very big issue. Um, also, obviously, you have a... I don't know whether we can describe it as a privileged position, but a ringside seat on the Eurozone a disaster. Uh, sorry, I didn't mean that. Uh, events. And I know you have views on it. Um, also, particularly relevant because you, Turkey, of course, had a financial crisis quite recently in the last decade and has gone through that and has uh, coped with this crisis from a, this point of view remarkably well. So no doubt you have lessons to teach us as well. So what is your perspective on where we are? Well, uh, when we talk about the current uh, global economic situation, and more specifically, what is going on in Europe and Eurozone. Uh, and if we really want to see sustainable growth, job creation, employment, and so forth, there is one very important concept which we, I think, have to emphasize over and over again, and that is confidence. When we don't see a medium of confidence, when, when consumers don't have trust for future, they don't spend, when corporations don't have confidence, they don't invest, and when banks are, have doubts about the future, they don't lend. And when these don't happen, the economy stops, financing channels stops, and we don't see growth. And how to attain confidence, how to regain confidence, it should be probably at the core of the policies in many, many countries. And for those countries where public debt is a source of concern, we don't think that fiscal stimulus will work. If a country has already high debt, and if this debt creates a lot of doubts in the markets, simply trying to spend more, have some kind of growth through just government spending, is probably not going to work. And in Eurozone, there has been some unfortunate trials in 2008, 2009, trying to give fiscal stimulus, and then have a very unfortunate result at the end of the day. For those countries where public debt is reasonable, and for those who have some fiscal space, maybe there might be some efforts. But 
what is most important here is about fiscal policies, there is an asymmetry. It is always easy to loosen fiscal policies. So when in, in 2008 and 2009, many European governments announced fiscal stimulus programs, they were hailed. And they said, okay, this is going to solve the problems. But when it is time to tighten the policies, it is very, very difficult. It has many costs. It costs the fortunes of the leaders. It costs the, the, the fortune of the, of the political parties in many countries. And the thinking about the fact that of that sensitivity of the fiscal policies, it is important to be on the prudent side when it comes to budget and public debt and so forth. Once keeping the fiscal policy at a prudent uh, phase, then for countries it is very important to have a very clear strategy and communicate this strategy very well so that the strategy is owned by the masses because if there is no local ownership of the policies, then probably those policies will not work. Do people understand? Do citizens of that country understand? Do they really understand the necessity of the uh, steps, maybe difficult steps, that is needed for, for future? And then having a medium-term uh, vision is also very important. Now, I have been attending many, many discussions in Davos, and we have been talking too much about year 2012, but if we are going to talk about growth and employment, it is not just the single one year we have in front of us. We have 2013, 2014, and, and for some policy action, it might be hurting growth in the short term today, but it may generate more and sustainable growth later on. So we should probably look at growth and uh, job creation with a medium-term approach, and the governments announcing these medium-term credible programs is going to be very, very crucial to bring some predictability about what's going to happen. If the companies or the financial sector doesn't have any idea about what's going to happen in, year, in this year in the United States, if we have all big doubts about what's going to turn out in the Eurozone this year, and if all the mass media is broadcasting this, how to expect people to spend more, how to expect companies to continue investment or hiring people, and how to invest the banks, although they have many, much liquidity in their hand to do their function of, of, uh, of lending. So this, the, the homework to be done country by country is going to be very important. So every single country should keep his house tidy and clean. And then international organizations, they are important tools, but they are not a substitute for the homework to be done in every single, single country. A more coordinated action is absolutely necessary in the Eurozone. We hope that this six-pack fiscal compact, we hope that this works. I think it's absolutely necessary to implement this in the Eurozone without any, any uh, slippages. And also G20, I think, has a big role also, probably underutilized, but an important role to have a better global coordination of the, of the policies. And it is very important today, to, during this year, for the countries within G20 not to just follow their own national interest, but also think about the global outlook, feel the global responsibility, because as Christine said at the very beginning, we are living all together. And if there's a serious collapse anywhere in the world, this is going to hurt all of us. Nobody is going to have a better position because of a collapse, serious collapse elsewhere, elsewhere uh, in the world. So, uh, in, uh, specific to Turkey, as, as Martin has, very uh, has, briefly, has asked, a little, a little we bit, have yeah. been very prudent on the fiscal side. And in 2009, we announced a very prudent, tight fiscal policy, a medium-term uh, fiscal program to even further down reduce our deficits. And many people have big doubts because they told us, look at Europe, look at everyone else. Everybody else is increasing spending and you are doing the reverse. But it paid off very well. The confidence was built up. Our growth rate was 9% in 2010. 8% in 2011, we have been actually uh, tightening things on the monetary policy side on the, um, and also on the banking side to contain the growth, to uh, prevent overheating or to keep our current accounts deficit under control and so forth. So we have followed quite a different path from the rest of our European neighbours, but we have got also quite different results at the end. Thank you very much. Um, let me turn now uh, at last to Asia. Um, we we'll start with um, Japan and Asia, um, with you, Minister Furukawa, please. Yeah, 
Okay. Are you speaking English? Yeah. Oh, you're speaking uh, English? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. 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 Well, thank you very much. Yeah, I'd like to start with the landscape of Japanese economy. Uh, we accept a relatively stable economic growth rate and low unemployment rate, and we are determined to continue to the financial stabilization of the Eurozone. Uh, the current government debt crisis in Europe inevitably affects on the global economy. Within this in mind, we expect that Europe makes its utmost effort to manage the challenges and endeavors to establish a firewall to calm down the market. Japan has been supporting this effort as a major purchaser of EFSF bonds, currently holding 16% of the outstanding issues. Once further engagement of the international community is required, Japan will collaborate closely with other countries and relevant part parties in supporting Europe's firm actions. However, I have somewhat of a concern that the crisis may also have a financial effect outside Europe, especially on the capital shortage in Asia. Japan will intensively concentrate its effort to stave off the capital outflow and will proactively commit to Asia's sustainable growth. The issues we are currently facing are not limited to the debt crisis in Eurozone. I'd like to point out more common and under underlying issues. This year, social connectedness and trust will be tested all around the world because of a number of destabilizing factors. The, these factors are low economic growth rates, high unemployment rates, and contentious debates in election campaigns. In confronting these challenges, the Japanese government is now working on composing a new growth model that pursues three elements altogether namely the economic growth, social inclusiveness, and environmental sustainability. Japan will closely collaborate with the economies of Asia and the OECD countries in this effort. We should pursue this dynamic and inclusive growth because mere economic growth will not resolve the dissatisfaction in the current economic system. As you witnessed, last year's Occupy Wall Street and a popular uprising in many countries around the globe are typical examples. Following this annual forum, I'm looking forward to elaborating for further discussion in the international community. And lastly, I would like to comment about uh, Japan's fiscal deficit issues. It's important to note that Japan's fiscal deficit is a pressing issue in terms of its volume. At the same time, it's also important to note that vast majority of the debt is financed by domestic saving. And we don't think this structure will cause an immediate crisis. However, tackling fiscal consideration is a pressing challenge we cannot leave behind. Our government has been working on these issues since fiscal year 2010, aiming to have the primary balanced debt to GDP ratio in five years, both raising the consumption tax rate in a phased manner and promoting economic growth through implementing, implementing the strategy for reverse of Japan are key components as they are the wheels of the same car. Thank you. Thank you very much. I'm um, very glad that you brought in Japan's fiscal position since we've had some very strong uh, positions on this absolutely crucial issue of fiscal austerity, which um, a number of people have referred to. I'd just like to point out that I have been in these sessions for about 15 years, every, and everyone that someone has been concerned uh, about the mounting tide of, of Japanese debt, which is, of course, now far and away the biggest in the world, and uh, relative to GDP, and uh, every, um, widespread concern about how long this can go on. And 
every year we discover that the Japanese government's long bond rate continues to be, or has been now for a very long time, round about 1%, uh, which is a problem which I suspect many other countries would quite like to have. So the, this is quite a complicated issue, how fiscal uh, policy interacts with the economy is a very, very complicated issue, very situation specific, that's obvious, and getting that situation right is very crucial, as Christine Lagarde uh, has mentioned at the be earlier on. Now I'm going to turn to Donald Tsang to talk about how you view uh, the global economy and sort of from your perspective, particularly looking at the Asian context, uh, which has already been stressed uh, by others, including um, Minister Furukawa. Please. Well, according to the IMF latest forecast, Asia is going to grow by over 7% in 2012. China, one of the big, bigger economies in Asia, is going to grow by more than 8% this year. And everything seems to be robust and rosy, despite what is happening in Europe and America. And in the case of Hong Kong, uh, we, have, uh, we have balanced our books, um, we, have, uh, we have zero debt, and I have a reserve which is going to see me through for two years spending, and uh, we, have, we have almost full employment at the moment. Seems look very nice. Um, I have been in public service, most of which involved in public finance for over four decades. Let me share with you, I've never been as scared as now about the world. What is happening in Europe, looking at back uh, what our experience was uh, in, in 1980, the crisis we have, have we had, and the, the crisis we had in the 1990s, uh, this, is, this is a very big issue. First of all, um, I agree entirely well, well, with, uh, with Christine that uh, um, nobody is immune. We are all connected with each other. Look at the speed of cont spread of contagion. When we, de when we dealt with the Asian financial crisis in, in the late 1990s, we were dealt largely in an Asian issue. It was very much we left to ourselves, and we overcame it. But it never spread to other areas. Now it's very different. In 2008, Ireland su suddenly stopped uh, reintroducing a way in which to protect the bank savings. Almost two days afterwards, the whole world followed suit, including Hong Kong. In other words, we are very much, after 10 years after the Asian financial crisis, much more interconnected than before. Okay, in the case of bank exposure, in the case of Hong Kong, we're hardly exposed to, to, to the European debt, uh, sovereign debt issue. We've checked all our banks, we do, we've done stress tests, tests, seems all right. But what about the counterparties? What about the banks they deal with in Europe? What about their own clients who will be in serious trouble? In other words, we do not know how deep this hole would be when the whole thing implodes on us. So looking at America now, I do not see a rad radical solution emerging before the presidential election. So 2012 is a critical year. Each one of us has to look at ourselves and what we can do. Most important is to protect the people of ourselves and protect the people of the neighbor. How we're able to secure the jobs, how we're able to go through life this year. Then I'm going back to our experience elsewhere. Maybe it's not relevant to the rest of the world, but I can share with you some of the things we have found. We have found. First of all, um, in the uh, in Asian financial crisis, we, we stopped the fire. We did something rather extraordinary at that time. I went into the stock market, I bought some shares. It was merely condemned and, and castigated by all over the world, by Americans, by some Europeans. I've got sympathy elsewhere. But what I did paled in insignificance what we have been, what I've seen other people have been doing. What is happening now in the world, what is in Europe now, you need decisive action, you need to overkill. That's the reason what I, I agree entirely with Deputy Prime Minister of Turkey, you need to inspire confidence. That confidence must come in decisive action of government, working together and do it quickly. Maybe two months ago we can deal with, in the case of Greece, we can deal with, a, uh, settle it with a 30% haircut. Now, even 50% is not easy. It's not easy to settle. 70% maybe is out of the books as well. So do it quickly. And you need resolution and need decisiveness. The second thing that we have discovered is when we dealt with the Asian financial crisis, we dealt with the institutional issue. We sought out the bank, we sought out the banks, we sought, we sought out the, the intermediary, the stock markets, the exchanges, the regulatory regimes, and so on. We have forgotten the people. There are five years of painful deleveraging which took place in Hong Kong. Assets were depreciated to the extent of 60%. Somebody who owned a home, a home, a home who used to, you, you, used to be five million dollars, and suddenly, and suddenly, he discovers only a cost is only worth about two million. Negative assets was a very widespread issue. Immediately, 
immediately your pessimism pervades the society and you have serious problem in your hand. In other words, you need to have quick fix. In the case of this, I think we have to look at not only the funding of the banks, you must look at the SMEs. We did very well in 2008. We maintained jobs, we secured the firms because we underwrote all the loans to the banks. We guarantee all the banks continue lending to your SMEs with a good reputation, good track record, and making sure they're able to survive. And they did. And at the end of the day, the default rate is almost zero. As a government, I didn't put up anything. I just give them all for the opportunity to do this thing. And then you must help the poor, making sure they see through life, Re help them reschedule the loan, the mortgages, making sure they were able to pay this electric bills and so on and so forth. So we have got an incentive package valued at more or less 6 or 7% of our GDP over a period of two or three years. Uh, we have got the money to do it. But even if you don't have the money to do it, find the money to do it, making sure the grassroots is at ease and they have the jobs ready for them. And for that reason, you then have again, confidence there and you have domestic consumption going. So while we are dealing with all these macro issues, the, 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 um, the, the rebalancing of the economy, the prudential supervision, all the things you need to do with the banks and, and so on, must make sure at the end of the day, 2012 is a critical year. If you can't get through it, the rebalancing, the effect of that will come through before, after that, 2012, at least, almost in two years after that. You have to get through 2012 and remember you have to deal with the people. This is where we serve. This is what public service is all about. Thank you very much. I think you made some incredibly important points. First about the fact that somebody like you, an observer like you, is that frightened, um, which I suspect is very wise and shrewd. I'm very, very concerned about the recrudescence of complacency over relatively small steps that have been taken. Please don't go away and think this is fixed uh, in any way. Uh, second, I, perhaps I can put this in slightly different language, you, you were at the epicenter of the Asian financial crisis, the last really big financial crisis, and the Western world gave you lots of very useful advice, uh, some of which was almost relevant, uh, such as speed of action and decisiveness and so forth, and we can truthfully said, say, and surely no one will disagree, that the Western world broadly has succeeded in failing to take its own advice pretty comprehensively, which is why four and a half years after this started, we're still in such an impressive mess. And four and a half years after the Asian financial crisis, Asia was recovering fantastically. It's a very, very important contrast, uh, though of course it was a slightly different problem. That, gives uh, uh, the cue, I think, to Bob Zerlick to tell us how he sees the world, um, the cons what are the position of developing and emerging countries in all this. We talked about capital being pulled back. We've looked at the, the failure to, to finish the Doha round, which you started. How concerned are you uh, about where we've got to? And what should we, what should we be thinking about of, for this year? Well, well thank you, Martin. And, um I figured at this point in the panel, uh, as we have, I think you've set out the issues very well, so I wanted to try to offer a slightly different perspective, so I'll share three observations. Um, first, when I was at the Khan G20 summit uh, in November, I uh, watched as the emerging market uh, heads of government were observing the European heads of government. And it was quite striking, as many people here will recall, this was right after one of the European <coughs> summits where it looked like there was progress. You had the call for the Greek referendum. And frankly, the European heads of government were in turmoil. Um, and the emerging market leaders were watching with feelings that seemed to me to be first a sense of confusion, then frustration, um, and then uh, some sense of, of, uh, of overall disdain. So one aspect of this is this has got to have effects on influence, perceptions of power in the world that are going to be quite significant for years to come. Second observation builds a little bit on what uh, Deputy Prime Minister Babajan and uh, Donald Tsang mentioned. A couple weeks ago, there was one of the first of the G20 deputies meeting. 
And while many topics were discussed, I'll share with you the major takeaway that I had from the report, which is that the emerging markets were saying, you know, we encountered this problem before. Uh, many of the countries around the room from the developed side urge us to take difficult reforms. We took difficult structural reforms. They're painful. They take political will. Now it's your turn. Get on with it. And that leads to the third point, which is that whatever we see come out over the course of this year or the next years, I think the world is never going to go back to the way it was. And your statistics that you started out, Martin, I think is with your second point, kind of show some of the significant shifts. But it's not only a question of economic numbers. It's also going to be a question of perceptions and attitudes. And what I see in the world economy now is that Emerging markets uh, are certainly not waiting for the developed world to get their act together because they're taking their own steps. They're not looking, as they might have in the past, to the United States or Europe or Japan uh, for solutions. And it's a very open question of who will be the exemplars in the system. It's not determined. It's not necessarily some of the rising powers. But it's an open question that relates to the last point, which is that what I perceive occurring is, as you mentioned, depending on how you count, you're maybe into the fourth year of this process. And there's a danger because there's a, fear, a weariness, a fatigue that's starting to run into the political system. Uh, at the same time, people are scared, there's anxiety, there's joblessness. And you can start to see the creeping populism, home country bias, uh, sense of uh, separation from the system. So in addition to finding some exemplars, those exemplars are going to have to pay a role in trying to move a cooperative process forward. And in some of the side discussions I've here had with some of the business people, it's quite striking. There's no absence of resources in the international system. Mark and I were talking about there's a lot of capital to invest. There's lots of possibilities. But frankly, some of this populism, creeping protectionism, anxiety about the future possibilities for investment affects the confidence and creates a danger of paralysis. So I simply underscore, Martin, your key point. What I picked up in the couple days I've been in Europe is I'm really glad the ECB took these actions. But let's not get complacent. This buys time. You still have to act. Thank you very much. This has raised an enormous number of questions. Let's just follow a few of them up. I'm going to start by looking at the Eurozone a little bit more in this question of firewalls and where they fit in, um, but it leads to something broader. And I, I will address this question initially to Christine Lagarde, but I know that others will have some thoughts on this. Let me look at it from the point of view of the emerging world. We are told uh, that, or they are told that um, the IMF needs enormous increase in resources, and it's pretty clear to them that it's related to the Eurozone crisis. Um, the question obviously arises, why should um, relatively poor countries, which have been well managed, accumulated large foreign currency reserves, contribute large amounts of money to support a zone which seems to be unwilling to support itself? Thank you, Martin. Um, four points to respond to your, um, your argument. First of all, no one is immune, neither developed countries anywhere in the world, nor low-income countries, nor middle-income countries. We've never been so interconnected. Number two, as much as an investment, it's also a statement of confidence for the multilateral process. Number three, if it is big enough, it will not get used. And the same applies to the Euro firewall, for that matter. And number four, if it was ever used, it's a very safe investment. Why? Because the IMF is a highly secured creditor, has always been paid back with a return on investment. And the reason it is always paid back is because, number one, it has significant reserves. I have to hold 20% of reserve. And more importantly, because we never lend without a program, without conditionalities, and without a very serious, thorough 
follow through to make sure that each and every installment has a consideration in terms of improvement of the macroeconomic situation of the country that takes it back to the market so that it actually pays back the IMF. I hope I've convinced you. First of all, I'm going to see whether you've convinced the panel. Um, Mark Carney. Um, let's I go mean, this is a yeah, really big let's go, question. Let's go to the European firewall itself, okay. um, which starts obviously with the European facilities, the FSF, the ESM, um, which I think quite broadly acknowledged uh, are currently insufficient in size and need to be supplemented. And that's one of the reasons uh, why uh, Madame Lagarde is, uh, they're not is focused even on functional. the issue. And they're not fully functional. The ESM is much more efficient than the FSF and greater focus on that. But what's the point of these firewalls themselves? I mean, we should get right to that. And the first point I want to make is something you've focused on, which is there should be an acknowledgement, first and foremost, that this is a balance of payments crisis more than a banking crisis and a fiscal crisis. There are issues in the banking sector, there's issues on the fiscal side, but they are more products, byproducts of this fundamental issue. Um, and as the Chancellor emphasized, one of the disturbing developments right now is that even with the measures of the ECB, um, the European financial system is beginning to renationalize. Um, so Italian flows are funding Italian bond purchases and there's less cross-border flows. That's incredibly inefficient. And so part of the point of these firewalls is, is to address that. And I would submit that one of the key elements of this is also providing some backstop certainty on bank capital. Doesn't necessarily have to go in, could be contingent, could be um, uh, contingent, I'll, I'll, I'll leave it as that. Um, but there should be greater certainty on bank capital so that there's greater certainty in terms of cross-border flows. The other point uh, behind, because if there's not, in a balance of payments crisis, as you know, um, you're restricted. You're restricted on cross-border finance. It deepens the, uh, uh, the scale of the downturn in the affected countries. It feeds back onto the fiscal side. So that's absolutely paramount. And then the other obvious purpose for these firewalls is to provide funding certainty for the affected nations over a reasonable period of time, which is going to be measured in two or three years. We are still going to be talking about Europe uh, next year when we're here, so that some of these reforms, most notably the structural reforms, have time to start to bear fruit. Now, the IMF, in the context of more European resources, more effective um, facilities, there is a role, potentially, for the IMF, a very constructive role, not just for Europe, but very importantly, as uh, Christine emphasized, uh, to provide some precautionary certainty for the rest of the world during this process. Chancellor Osborne, if I may ask you about this, um, not as a representative of the Eurozone, um, what is your view actually of the, re I mean, at the very least everybody I've heard, and I've spoken to a number of people privately and I've heard it publicly, who isn't part of it, the Euro isn't inside the Eurozone, insist that the Eurozone itself put up more usable money. That they don't, there is sort of a sense that being, uh, there's a risk transfer going on, which is quite unfair and illegitimate. After all, this is one of the richest, it's one of the two biggest economies in the world. If you look at it in aggregate, it's incredibly rich. Why should this, why should the rest of the world come along and do this? There's an additional factor, and I might come back to this, is some people feel, and I must say I'm one of them, that the IMF has got itself into great difficulty for perfectly understandable reasons with some of the programs it's been got into. Um, so that it's not even clear that the IMF can perform its role well within this incredibly difficult context. So what do you think needs to be done by the Eurozone itself to make it reasonable to demand or expect a, bigger, a big contribution to the firewall from outside? Well, I... I the, the Eurozone needs to provide uh, a significant increase in uh, available resources. I st st stress both the words significant increase and available. In other words, it has to be a deployable uh, firewall in that sense. Uh, and, and I think the Eurozone leaders understand that, that there aren't going to be uh, further contributions to the IMF from other G20 countries, uh, including Britain, unless we see the color of their money. Um, and I think that is a reasonable request. Uh, our other requests are that uh, the IMF is not uh, in any way debased as an institution. In other words, all the things we admire about the IMF remain, the full conditionality, the rigorous independent analysis, that it helps countries, not currencies. Um, and if those conditions are met, then certainly Britain uh, would think uh, very carefully about 
uh, providing further resources and, uh, and of course I'd probably have to go to my parliament to recommend it but uh, I would be willing to do so in those circumstances. I think if we accepted, if we said that um, the IMF was never going to be there to help countries who had created a single currency, then first we would beg the question why those currency, countries would want to remain in the IMF because it wouldn't necessarily um, be of any use to them. Uh, and I think it would also be to undermine the founding principle of the IMF, which was that in the end we shouldn't just let people and countries deal with their problems alone, that the world should try and help uh, those uh, countries. And that was one of the lessons of the last great financial crisis uh, in the 1930s. The final point I make is I don't think that is the sort of lasting solution, however, to the Eurozone. Ultimately, if you're in a single currency, as the United Kingdom knows and the United States knows and others, you have to transfer fiscal resources around the country to make good uh, differences in competitiveness, <coughs> regional competitiveness. Uh, and ultimately, for all the structural reforms that are going to be undertaken, we hope uh, and believe in the Eurozone, there's still going to be regional disparities within the Eurozone uh, when it comes to competitiveness. And I think the price of having a single currency, the remorseless logic of having a single currency, is that you make good those differences, you ameliorate those differences by transfers of funds, whether it's from New York City to uh, Alabama or from the city of London to the north of England, those transfers take place. And that is what, how you can make a single currency work. It's one of the reasons Britain didn't want to join the euro. Uh, but having, the euro now having been created, I think those fiscal transfers are going to be a permanent feature uh, of a, a euro that works. It's a pity uh, that we don't have... Uh, um a representative of Germany on this panel because I, I have a pretty good idea of what the response would be to this suggestion. Um, Mr. Tsang, Donald Tsang, yeah, you want I, to go? And the outside perspective is really very interesting. Yes, it's, it's, it's what I'm looking at it from a market point of view. When we, people concentrate on talking about the size and the strength and who's contributing material for building the firewalls, in fact, there's other way of looking at it. No matter how hard, how strong the firewall is, the market will look at exactly the nature of the economies, which is firewalls, is protecting. If the firewalls are protecting an economy with suffering from short-term liquidity problems, that's one case. If the firewall is protecting what we call, what consider to be insolvent economy, there's another matter altogether. Uh, no matter how hard, how strong the firewall is, it won't survive. The question is, how are we able to do this? What sort of, what sort of economies are protecting at the end of the day? If it isn't a question, then people look at how this economy will survive in the longer term. This is not a question of balancing the books and how we will generate growth. So for that reason, you have to find ways in which to energize the private sectors in the European economies from a market point of view. They're making sure in the medium and longer term, these are viable concerns. These are sovereign economies. So in that case, the question of firewalls would be less significant, in my view. One of the really big questions uh, is, of course, making precisely that distinction in the, in the, nature, in the, uh, in the case of states. It can be quite difficult to dis define with what the, the borderline between liquidity, insolvency, insolvency, uh, and there has been enormous debate, obviously, in Europe about this. Um, but it obviously is linked in part on what sort of growth they get, what sort of interest rates they get, what sort of policies they pursue. There are clearly plenty of countries you can per perfectly well argue that are, are illiquid but insolvent, uh, liquid but not insolvent at the moment. Um, but uh, the point is absolutely fundamental, and uh, it clearly arises in the case of Greece, which we're now dealing with. Um, Minister Furukawa. Yeah. <coughs> uh, I just want to mention about uh, speaking of the role of the IMF, uh, I think that the most important thing is that Europe itself at most effort. Uh, otherwise, without the, you know, the firm action of the Europe, I don't think that uh, developing countries like China or other countries are not uh, so willing to pay more money for the IMF, even if IMF uh, secured uh, the return. Because, you know, uh, under the condition that the Europe uh, makes their most effort and they make firm actions, and then IMF uh, can support the European countries 
And in that condition, I think, with, uh, including our Japan, Jap our Japan uh, I think that uh, other countries, other international communities, we are willing to uh, support uh, the Eurozone through IMF. Mr. Babajan. Well, uh, the whole financial system is based on a certain fundamental concept, and that is the trust to the state. So the value of the sovereign signature, and that is at the core of the financial system and also the corporate world functions on top of the, 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 that core. Now, when uh, Greece started to have problems, a country which is only 2% of the GDP, by the way, it was very important, and we made this very vocal, that at any cost, the default of Greece should have been prevented. Even PSI, private sector involvement, we think it is wrong. Because when you let a country in the European Union, a country in the Eurozone, to default partially, orderly, disorderly, whatever, a default is a default. And it has raised the risk premium of the whole Eurozone. It has raised the risk premium of the European Union overall. So every single country has already, to, already started to pay for it. And now that once that door is open for defaults, then it is possible and likely that other countries could also go through that door. And once that, again, coming back to the concept of confidence, once that is hurt, it is going to take years, if not decades, to fix this. So it, no matter what, I think it is now time to show serious demonstration of solidarity. And within the Eurozone, if possible, if not possible with the only resources of the Eurozone, then include other resources, but make sure that countries don't default. And these are countries of the developed world. These are the countries of the modern world. And these, uh, the, 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 the technicians, the academicians, the politicians, I, I think what is needed to be done in every country is very well known. There is no doubt about what kind of policy action to be implemented. What is to be done is known. What is important is to go ahead and implement this. So when we talk about firewalls and so forth, firewall, no matter what the number is, it has a limit. We can talk about, okay, 500, <coughs> 1 trillion, but it has a limit. But the, when we lose the sense of solidarity, and when we open doors for defaults, then just talking about certain fixed amount of numbers would probably not even be enough to prevent the fires or even bigger fires. So before the situation gets really uh, out of hand, it is very important to give the guarantees and assurances what kind of method is necessary to make sure that a Eurozone country should not default. And once that guarantee, once that confidence is taken, is maintained, and then built up with fiscal, with fiscal steps, with measures, with reforms, and so forth. But first, confidence, and then steps to be taken. The order is, I think, very important. We, there are so many questions, Ray, but let's just, just focus on one question. People won't be surprised if I raise this, because it's all already come through with really quite clear differences of emphasis in the panel. So let's get the issue out there, which is the role of auster fiscal austerity, uh, who should have it, how much, how you manage it. Obviously, some people, and I'm fairly well known, I'm one of them, um, is, are concerned that we're, we are in a situation where a lot of the private sector is deleveraging for reasons we know, um, massively so. Uh, business, for a whole range of reasons, lack co lacks confidence. I accept that is an issue. If the whole range of big governments, and remember that the, the governments we're talking about account for about half the world economy, all go into austerity together, this is the, the paradox of thrift, you end up actually with a worse fiscal outcome and no growth. And that's what we are, that somebody like me is concerned about. That doesn't give you the, the exit strategy. Now, you're very clear that you need fiscal control. You are, of course, too. Christine Lagarde has put a somewhat different emphasis on this issue. Let's get this out. So let's, uh, Chancellor Oswald, let's say, how do you see the dangers of the collective rush, particularly in the Eurozone now, everybody uh, consolidating at the same time? Why do you think this is going to work? Well, I think... The, the issue is debt. We are, we are recovering from a balance sheet recession. And let me speak about the UK uh, 
I, I became the finance minister when the country had an 11% budget deficit. This was the highest budget deficit Britain had ever run outside of the Second World War. And uh, if I, I think you've seen, over the, frankly, over the last 18 months, countries that have not been able to put forward convincing programs of deficit reduction have had to chase the market, have seen their market rates go up, have seen the problem get worse on them, and they've ended up having to do more austerity than perhaps they would have had to have done if they'd set out a credible plan and legislated for it uh, at the beginning. Uh, and I think uh, what we've done in Britain has uh, achieved two things. One, it has kept those market rates low and, and so on, but it's also prevented a spillover into our financial system. You know, Britain is the home of one of the world's largest global financial centres, uh, the home of some of the world's largest banks. If there had been a spillover from concern about UK sovereign debt into our financial system, it wouldn't just have been Britain that would have suffered, the whole world would have suffered. So I think it has provided an anchor. I don't think it is, uh, uh, I think it is necessary, but I don't think it is sufficient. I've never argued that the only thing you should do is try and uh, reduce your deficit, reduce the fact that Britain uh, was consuming 50% of its national income uh, uh, in, in terms of public expenditure. Uh, I've always believed you also have to undertake structural reform, make your business <coughs> tax system competitive, uh, undertake... Uh, uh, reforms to education and the like. I've, I've never thought it was, uh, as I say, uh, sufficient. It is necessary. And uh, as I say, I think we've had, frankly, um, a rather painful experiment with some of my neighbours of what happens if you don't secure market confidence in your ability to pay your debts. Christian Lagarde, how does the fund view this issue? You talk, specific, you talk specifically but somewhat elliptically, obviously, about countries that have room for manoeuvre and countries that don't. How do you define room for manoeuvre? in the present context? First of all, in terms of general principle, uh, I remember the, uh, I think it was the beginning of 2009, at the time when the IMF actually recommended stimulus packages. Indeed, I and, can remember. Uh, Don't miss, your predecessor did so on uh, this panel, absolutely. I think, for the, for the first time. And there was actually a hint that 2% of GDP would be probably appropriate for each and every country in the world to actually, re to actually react to the unfolding of the then financial crisis arising out of the United States. And that was a shift at the time. My sense is that we need to be careful with those sort of broadcasted, general, one-size-fits-all messages. Uh, because each country is specific, each country is different, the amount of public spending will vary from one country to the other. And I think that the message needs to be tailored and made really specific to the situation of the country. So first principle, no one size fits all. It has to be tailor made, custom made, uh, customized to the specificities of the country. We see countries in general falling into three categories. First category is that of countries that are in such bad shape or have so much room to tighten that they just have to go for fiscal consolidation, go fast, go deep, get it done, the old system, if you will, you know, front-loaded programs and, and bounce back from a hard uh, uh, prescription. <coughs> Second category is those countries that should let automatic stabilizers play out. That's the case for the UK, for instance. The fiscal revenues go down because the state collects less tax, it spends a bit more because social safety nets have to play out, and that is fine, and that's, you know, a perfect uh, track to be on. And then you have some countries, not many at the moment, but, you know, I'm not going, I'm, I'm not going to go through the list of them, but around the world I would say there is a handful of them that have the fiscal space to actually slow down the fiscal consolidation path without violating their domestic rules, because some of them have those in-house domestic rules that have to do with fiscal consolidation and balanced budget and all the rest of it. Uh, so that's, Martin, what I, would, what I would define as those three categories, customized um, treatment of fiscal consolidation that is, that is needed. Mark Honey. 
very, two very quick points. Uh, two very quick points, if I may. One of the things that has to be done when making those judgments about consolidation is to reinforce an enabling environment for business investment. And I mean, I, I, I'll use the UK as an example with the, with the focus on infrastructure and, and public-private partnerships, the corporate tax rate. These, these are the type of things that help, also can help unlock that business investment, provided you go to financial system. So that is incredibly important. Um, but let me just draw attention. We don't have a representative of the U.S. on this panel. Um, there's, we have two and a half percentage points at least of fiscal drag built in into the United States in 2013. I think there's some allusion, perhaps, I don't want to put words in your mouth, Christine, but I just did, uh, to the United States in that situation. In an environment where um, you have a central bank that is clearly at the zero lower bound for a long period of time, uh, that's purchasing assets, that you are the reserve currency, uh, one has to question the wisdom of fully um, of, of having that level, to, starting January 1, 2013, two and a half percentage points down uh, on the level of GDP because of the fiscal multipliers. I'm going to turn it to the floor. I mean, we could go on for many more hours, but I, I think to give the opportunity to people to ask questions. Um, very difficult to see people. Uh, the person in the third row, I think, <coughs> if you'd stand up, um, say you are, and it's a very, very brief question. Uh, Larry Elliott of The Guardian. Uh, there are 75 million young people under 25 without work in the world today. How serious a problem is this and what should be done about it? I would have thought it's much more than 75 million, but uh, uh, we won't quibble over numbers. I'll take two or three questions and handle them. The person in the front row will be good enough to stand up. And, um, Thank you. Uh, Luigi Buttiglione from Brevan Howard Assets Management. I just want to, maybe it's a question for Mrs. Lagarde, I want to put together the comment by comment by Governor Carney and by yourself. Governor Carney spoke, I think, very correctly about the balance of payment crisis. You, you spoke about competitiveness. And I think if one puts the two things together, this means that there is a, a Euro crisis. I mean, one has to face it. I mean, the problems are stemming, which are stemming from Europe stem from competitive, lack of different competitiveness. And so this is why we need the structural reforms and so on. This means also that quite likely when the euro experiment was started, it was not optimal. Do we have to think, uh, to, if you want to think about confidence in the market, do we have to think that now the structural reforms can make this area an optimal currency area within a sufficiently uh, short period of time? This is confidence. The rest, of, as, as Governor Carney said correctly, I think these firewalls, if without that, uh, don't matter very much. Thank you very much. Okay, I'll take one more question. Somewhere at the back, I can't see very clearly, I'm afraid. Somewhere at Back, yes, that would somebody over there. It's incredibly Thank bright. Thank you. Yves Monzon from Pictet. Uh, I'd like to hear Chief, Ex Chief Executive Tanks and uh, Governor Kearney's view on whether or not the ECB should participate in the Greek restructuring. Whether the ECB should... Should participate or not on the Greek haircut. Ah, the Greek haircut. The Greek and who was the other person you, whose views you wanted, apart from Governor Carney? Donald Tank. Uh, Chief Executive Tsang. Ah, Greek haircut. Okay. Good questions. Um, I'll go second. I think I'll have to ask Bob Zerlick first. 75 million young people unemployed. Um, actually, must be far more. A problem not just in the, develop, but in the developing world. We see it as a central issue in what's happened in North Africa and in the Middle East. It's a central concern for you. From your perspective, both in the World Bank and more widely, how important is this issue and what, if anything, should be done about it? Well, it's important across uh, a range of things. W number one, um, you know, what we've seen, unfortunately, is that people often don't get a good start in terms of employment and skills that can uh, affect them their whole lives. Number two, uh, this is a tremendously then underutilized resource to contribute to countries and economies. Um, Three, there's a specific issue that we're dealing with and others are about the, the school, the work transition and some of the skills development that will be part of this. So all of this is part of the bigger issue that I think some of us have been trying to draw out, which is that it's not enough to muddle through. <laughs> It's, it's not enough to just get liquidity to the system. And it's frankly, it's not enough just to do the fiscal fix. There's another tone here that you've heard a little bit, particularly from the emerging markets and a little bit from Mark, which is, and, and also from George, about the structural reforms, about trying to create the basis for competitiveness going forward. 
But the reality is, if you're going to do fiscal consolidation and you're going to do structural reforms, it's also helpful to have some in context of growth occurring. And there's different ways that that can occur. That was your question on the fiscal part. But frankly, there's other aspects that are related to open markets and trade. And frankly, removing some of the impediments to growth that we see in the private sector where, uh, again, there's resources to be deployed. A part of the point here, which is a very big point, presumably, is that policy has to be much more in the round. We're so focused on fin fiscal and financial problems, we're missing that. Um, but, but let me just, just one little point on this, because I almost said it on your other point. You know, Europe is so focused on the Eurozone. You know, as you've seen just in the past couple of days, we've tried to organize some support for Southeastern Europe and the Balkans. Some of these are European Union countries. We got some information from the BIS yesterday that verified what I've been worried about, which is you're going to see a credit contraction as these banks pull back. You've got big events in North Africa. The events in the Eurozone and European Union are definitely going to have the effects on their trade and their ability to overcome some of the economic issues related to the political problems. We're seeing it in trade finance. And so, again, I do think there's a little bit of myopia even on the fiscal side because some of this goes back to how you implement the banking regulations. And frankly, the European banking authorities' approach towards the higher capital standards, in my view, did not take account of these risks. I think it's now adjusting. But so we've got ripple and wave effects of this, and they affect young people, old people, and a lot of regions that we should be concerned about. Let me just take two very quick points for you, Mark Carney. One of them was raised here as a member of the trade union of central bankers. Um, should central bankers take losses in uh, when they've acted as lender of last resort in a a foolhardy manner. Uh, and uh, the second question, since I rated earlier and Bob has just rated it again, is the regulatory system, of which you are of course a central part, actually providing a completely confused message, uh, closing doors after stable, uh, closing stable doors after horses have fled, sort of making the, the banks incredibly resilient at exactly the point, or trying to move at exactly the point when actually you want regulatory forbearance? Uh, on, the, uh, on the first question on the Greek restructuring, um, part of the spirit I took from Donald Tsang's remarks uh, is get it right uh, when you do something, do it quickly, do it right. Um, what's incredibly important with this what comes out of the current discussions is that it's credible. And so the size of the haircut, the aggregate haircut to Greece has to lead to a credible debt sustainability analysis, full stop. It can't be just meeting a number because the number was there before. And if that requires uh, fuller participation from the private sector and potentially the public sector, uh, so be it. Uh, then the question is how should it be done for the public sector? Uh, it's not going to surprise you as a card-carrying member of the Guild of Central Bankers that fiscal decisions are the responsibilities of governments, monetary decisions of the central banks, central banks ultimately backed by governments. It's better to sort these things out ex ante, but they may need to be sorted out in real time. There is a backstop in Europe. It should be used. Uh, on financial reform, three levels of clarity we need to provide. We provided it on capital, to be absolutely clear. The capital rules are out there. The definitions are there. Banks know what they are, including the SIFI surcharges. Those countries who had additional supplements have done so. Anybody else should speak now or, or, or hold back. Capital's clear. It's a question of taking time to get there. The second clarity, which we should uh, establish this year, is clarity on resolution, ending too big to fail. I'm not sure we're going to get there for every institution, but we should, we should get as far as we can and make it clear what's left to be done. But then the final clarity we really need to get back to is to be absolutely clear that actually there is a tremendous value to open markets, uh, cross-border markets, not just within Europe, we talked about it, but global cross-border markets. Um, there's lots of worthy, boring, but important plumbing that we're doing in derivative markets, repo markets, other things. But we need to think about um, the implications of regulation um, with respect to market making, proprietary trading, shadow banking the net impact on cross-border flows of capital, which is going to be important uh, to uh, get the global economy from a 3 percent per annum to a 4 percent and 5. And Bob's points on trade finance uh, are, 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 are fully appropriate. Final question. Are we trying to turn the Eurozone into an optimal currency area ex post in about a year or two? And if so, is this in any way a viable project? 
Um, I think that was the question. If I, it wasn't, it can't be re-asked. May I ask Christine Lagarde what her view on that question is? Perhaps there's a wrinkle on this. Perhaps the way I put it in something, you mentioned competitiveness. Competitiveness is a relative, not an absolute concept. So we're saying that some people should become competitive relative to other people. We know who, what, who we mean. Are the other people prepared to accept becoming less competitive? That's essentially the same question. <coughs> well, don't you think, Martin, that everybody has to be more competitive? I know it's a relative, it's a relative issue, and, and you measure against somebody else, and that somebody else will never everybody say, Everybody can I want... become more efficient. Everybody, everybody has to be... Everybody can become more, more efficient, but everybody can't become more competitive. It's very important okay. to distinguish Every, every, the two. Everybody has to compete to be more efficient. Yes. Can we settle on that? Great. Yes. Okay. Yes. Well, th that's what is needed. And it's not something that the IMF can actually monitor, control, or encourage by way of its programs, because our programs are short-term generally, and they deal with balance of payment issues. So I, I can see your point about our current programs, particularly in that part of the world, with a, a bit of ambiguity as to the purpose that, that uh, the countries have, given the length of time that it's going to take some of them to consistently compete for more efficiencies given where they start from. But we cannot give up on that either. And uh, I think that it's, it's perfectly legitimate that the IMF continues to be involved as, as, a, as a gesture, as a statement from the multilateral international community and with the tools that it has to be actually on the ground to make sure that there is delivery, that there is implementation of some of the conditionalities that are embedded in our programs. I think that will help uh, in any event. But presumably we would agree, and I'm just Chancellor Osborne, as we all accept, surely, that the structural reforms are necessary, <coughs> essential, uh, but the, 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 the underlying efficiency stroke competitiveness problems which have emerged in the Eurozone, these aren't going to be fixed in a, in a few months. We're talking about a, a multi-year this, of course, is true for all countries. Isn't that the case? Well, the, these structural reforms will take many, many years. But I come back to the point I made earlier. You know, I don't think they're ever going to be sufficient. I think the, you are going to, to make the single currency work in the long term, uh, it, there are going to be permanent fiscal transfers, in my view. Uh, that, might, that can be done in an opaque way through a central bank. It can be done in a semi-opaque way through uh, euro bonds, or it can be done through direct budget transfers. But that, that is what's required to make a single currency work. And I'm not claiming that's a particularly easy thing to deliver politically within the Eurozone, but I think it is an essential component uh, to bringing long-term stability to the euro. Minister Furukawa, you wanted to comment on this yes. issue. Uh, speaking of the com com competitiveness, I think it's very important each country is trying to, uh, to strengthen their, its competitiveness. But uh, in the global world, uh, the fair compet competition is very important. Sometimes uh, countries trying to make use of, uh, devaluate the, their own currencies. And by making a devaluate the currency, uh, they're trying to uh, improve their competitiveness. But it's not a fair competition. So the, under the fair current, currency level, uh, the fair competition is really works. So I think that uh, not to use the currency uh, policy uh, <laughs> as a way of uh, increase uh, their own um, uh, competitiveness. I can't imagine this is directed at a country that has just announced a zero rate uh, for, for, to 2014, I think, which will mean that effectively seven years of free money. Um, I think I can possibly take one incredibly short question for one person. If anybody has a question, or we exhausted the audience. Okay, a very short question for one person. Um, hello. Hello, yeah. Um, so the world has about 7 billion people according to the latest figures. Um, the advanced region, Europe, America, Japan, collectively have under 1 billion. So I just wondered what the um, IMF, World Bank and the leadership of the advanced countries are proposing in 2012 for 
the poorer regions of the world, and there are 4 billion poor people um, in the world. So what are the policies uh, for them? I'm going to give Bob one minute to answer that question. I'm sorry for the... That's okay. Which is obviously, in some well, sense, the most important question asked. Well, it's actually also the opportunity because, you know, some two-thirds of global growth has come from the developing world over the past five years. So there's opportunities in areas such as infrastructure, which can create jobs today, productivity tomorrow, also services and goods from the developed world. So we're trying to emphasize that. Second, because of the risks, we're trying to do whatever we can to draw lessons from other developing countries about effective social safety nets. There's been tremendous success of this Mexican and Brazilian model. We've now extended to some 40 other countries. Uh, but for some countries that don't have that capacity, you need other alternatives. And, so, and third, and that's going to be important for food security or a whole uh, coast of things that could uh, happen. Um, and, and third is to continue the structural reforms that I was referring to, which help make the private sector possibilities uh, in emerging markets. So if you're actually thinking about allocation of capital to produce growth in the global system, this should be the bright spot. I'm going to have to conclude. I'll just make um, four remarks uh, about what has been said, and one, three remarks and one sort of concluding point. First, I think it's been a very rich discussion. I'd love to have gone on longer. Um, I think one of the biggest less things that comes out of this, the world economy is slowing, the Eurozone is clearly still a concern. Um, we haven't talked fully about some very important parts of the world, um, but I think that concern remains. It's very, very important to remember that the, the great thing that has made a difference to people's perception above all is a change in monetary policy or perception of monetary policy in Europe. The US is doing uh, this again. I mean, essentially, ever since the beginning of the crisis, we've used central banks in a completely unprecedented way. Completely unprecedented way. I think this was absolutely necessary, but it is incredibly important to understand that as long as that remains the case, we're still in a crisis. As long as we have these monetary policies, they, the central banks are telling you that this is a contained depression. That's what these rates mean. What else could they mean? The second point, which comes out very clearly, is a very strong sense that the Eurozone can, should be helped from outside, but only if it helps itself. And this panel, which is all of outsiders, seem pretty clearly agreed that it hasn't helped itself enough um, in a whole range of respects, both in the short term and the long term. And the fact that the outside world thinks that way is itself very, very important. The third point strength is that there's a lot of discussion about competitiveness, fair competition, austerity issues. Underneath all that in the world we're talking about, any economist starts thinking about beggar my neighbor concerns. And that links with the trade policy issues. If everybody is fighting for market share by depressing wages and reducing domestic demand, we have an adding up problem. That's my perception at the world level, and it's something we really have to think about. And the final point I would make, is, which it comes out again and again, is that we're living in a different world in terms of relative weights of countries, relative importance of countries, and I think the West still just hasn't begun to wake up to this, the significance of this fact. And so I will make one last very provocative remark, which is that I will know that we have a different, we in the West have recognized this when the immensely distinguished heads and brilliant heads of the international organizations on this panel will be replaced by people who are respectively not European and not American. Um, <laughs> Might be some time. Uh, or in the other order. I don't expect it to happen, but it has to happen. I think we should uh, congratulate the panel. We've had a very rich discussion, and I hope it has raised <laughs> your concerns. And you don't go away from Davos as complacent as some people seem to me to have become. We haven't begun to get through this incredible mess that we in the West have created. Thank you very much.